anarchy, insolent, willfully primitive. The new message screams anarchy, violence, and brutal realism. There was another kind of musical revolt in 1968. Three bright, well-schooled musicians came out of the Chicago club scene to take rock and roll apart and put it back together again. Let others celebrate drugs and lay on the hard metal. The young men from Chicago brought forth musical style, sophistication, and technique. The musicians, Walt Parazeta, Danny Serafine, and the late Terry Kath. The band, the Chicago Transit Authority. Today, simply Chicago. What Chicago wanted to be, I think, in the beginning, among other things, was, was uh, kind of uh, the Beatles with, with the brass section. Uh, we wanted to be able to play a number of styles of music. When we first started, we were playing clubs in Chicago, and we were playing Hendrix tunes with brass arrangements. Uh, we, were, we were doing Ray Charles tunes, uh, uh, Little Anthony's tunes with just far out brass arrangements. I think, I think we play most nights like 9 to 3.30, 9 to 4.30 on the weekends, you know, 45 on, 15 on, and uh, yeah, it was tough. In an industry where everyone seeks the spotlight, Chicago is unusual. Despite all their success, the individual band members have remained nameless, and their albums have followed the same tradition, numbered with a variation on the same logo instead of named. We felt at the time that it was that, that the music was was more important than, than establishing, you know, like I say, a star personality in the band. I think that um, I think that often uh, detracts from the 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 contributions of, of all the members of the band. Yeah. Pete Zatera, often called the dissident member of Chicago, has a different story. It was by design. Uh, when we first started, we were we were always threatened by our ex uh, uh, manager producer who would all, who would use this in time of uh, you know if we weren't seeing things his way he would say you know you can be replaced you know wow oh, I mean I can I, you know I thought I was in the group you know so he would kind of use that you know. And it was a design to keep us under his, uh, you know, under his glove, to, to face this nameless band, so that, it, you know, if we did step out of line, and you know, in his eyes, boom, next. And uh, I think we sort of overcome that. But by the late 70s, Chicago couldn't overcome their problems. Things began to slide. Their music didn't catch on. It was almost as if the group didn't know what time it was. January 23, 1978, lead guitarist Terry Kath shot himself. Terry is my best friend uh, and a uh, unique person. I think uh, had he been in any other group, he would have been the guts of the group and, uh, and uh, a very, it's a very complex chemistry in this band and uh, every ingredient is essential and Terry's ingredient was essential. So, uh, so when we lost him, it was definitely disruptive and, and uh, a lot of chaos. What really happened, Bobby? I mean, uh, just to set the record straight, as you know, the facts that came out was that uh, it was a 9mm pistol and... 9mm and pistol. Uh, uh, the clip was empty. There was a bullet in the chamber. Uh, Terry was uh, uh, getting ready to do a solo record and had been rehearsing at the house of uh, uh, one of the fellas in our crew. And... Uh, they had sat down to talk together, and Terry was just fooling with the gun. And uh, um, the gun went off. It was, it was always a struggle without Terry to try to sound like anything, to try because we couldn't sound like, like we sounded with him, and we didn't like the way we sounded without him. The 
the death of Terry Kath was only one of the problems that beset Chicago. Tomorrow on Night Watch, we'll take a look at how the group coped with drug problems and a charge by the Wall Street Journal that one of their members had organized crime connections. As time goes on. shocking, confusing death of Terry Kath shattered the spell. Chicago, playing in wondrous harmony. Chicago, the rock and roll juggernaut, invincible to all those distractions that plagued others, fell apart. Uh, your uh, party priorities start to get a little twisted, I think. Uh, you know, normally you would wait to after the gig to uh, party, and then it... Then you start partying during the gig, and then you start partying before the gig, and pretty soon it's like one big party, and uh, it's kind of fun. Start out being fun, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey, let's get up and go on stage, you yeah. know? You know, I mean, this is a lot more fun, isn't it? You know, and then, and then pretty soon it stops being fun, and it starts being, well, uh, I need a couple of pills to get me up to play, you know? I mean, I was totally convinced that, that you know, that I had to be, you know, have swag to, to face the crowd. And it didn't help when a front page Wall Street Journal article in 1979 claimed that organized crime was trying to turn Chicago into mob rock. We were just sort of boring, uh, you know, as the, as the press media goes. So we've just never had press, so I looked at that as kind of like, not bad. Little mafia connections, hey, well, what the heck, it's press, you know. And it, you know, and it got us a lot of press, but it was, you know, belong. Nothing to it. No. The Wall Street Journal report appeared to tie drummer Danny Seraphine to reputed mafia figures. Manager Jim Garcia reported the newspaper used round-the-clock bodyguards. We spoke with Jim Garcia, and he told us that neither their parting nor his bodyguards had any connection to an organized crime takeover. Nightwatch also asked a former member of the Chicago Crime Commission's investigation about the outcome of this story. His response was that it had, quote, just kind of died a natural death. Unquote. In 1980, record sales began to slide. After three declining albums, they were without a record company. It uh, stopped, uh, stopped any kind of faith that they ever had in us. They just stopped that. So we, we decided, well, we should go look somewhere else. And uh, uh, at that point, we were, we were sort of like just... You know, we're totally lost. We had accomplished virtually everything you can accomplish as a group, you know. We TV shows, round the world tours, platinum records, uh, the whole thing. Um, I think it was time for us to stop and really re-examine our commitment to each other and what we wanted to do. We sort of had to learn, you know, had to learn the lesson the hard way, and that was by, uh, you know, not happening three, four, five years, we just didn't happen, you know? And I think when you lose that, you know, fan, you know, that fan acceptance, and, and uh, boy, that's just the hardest, you know, it's just the hardest to take. And I think that's what really started turning us around. It was like, hey, you know, nobody's gonna, you know, do it but us, guys, you know? So let's, let's get it turned around. Remember how we told you Chicago broke all the rules from the very beginning? They took the intensity of rhythm and blues, the insolence of rock and roll, and somehow professionalized it. Well, let's bring the Chicago story up to date. They broke all the rules again when they financed their new album, Chicago 16. The results? Success by any standard. Being able to uh, enjoy this, <laughs> this uh, renaissance is uh, it's something that I think uh, uh, a lot of bands, you know, maybe never get a chance to do. We've been able to struggle out for a long time and, and take a break and look around and lay back and then come back and do it again. Uh, we have a lot of, there's a lot of pride involved with what's going on now.